a magnificent, wonderful round of applause for Whitney Lee. Thank you. Ah, hi, y'all. I have, I have um, jokes. I resent that they're called dad jokes as a mom, and I like the jokes, too. Uh, yeah. So why did the man fall down the well? Because he couldn't see that well. Ah, okay. So I don't usually start presentations talking about me at all. Like, a lot of speakers will have an intro slide. I don't do that. Like, my strategy is to knock your socks off with my technical knowledge and make you, like, curious about who I am. So then at the end, when I, like, casually show my contact information, then you're super interested. And so this one's really different for me. It's actually pretty uncomfortable for me to talk so much about myself. But since my journey fits into the theme of The Beat Goes On, here we are. So um, I'm going to get personal before I dig into some technical stuff. The entire first half of this presentation is about me, and I have to start by bragging because my career journey isn't that interesting unless there's some success element at the end, right? So I am an international keynote speaker. Thank you. <laughs> I've given not one, but two earned KubeCon keynotes. The first one was in Shanghai. Actually, the second one was in Shanghai, China. And the first one I gave was in Detroit. So for context, me in the photo, I'm right there. That's me. That's how big the room is. It's like it uh, holds 10,000, I believe. And another bit of context, I gave my first conference talk ever six months before. Not my first keynote, my first conference talk ever to a room of like 20 people six months before I did this keynote. I was scared out of my mind at that moment, but it went well. So the company I work for, VMware Tanzu, last fall they had me keynote their uh, VMware Explorer, the flagship conference. And then also I keynote um, community conferences like this one pretty regularly. So I, I keynoted KCD, stands for Kubernetes Community Days. So I KCD Guadalajara in February, and I'll keynote KCD Munich coming up here in June. But the keynote today is super special. It's more important than all of the others because Austin is my home. <laughs> Thanks. I've lived in Austin for over 20 years. So when I moved here, my son hadn't even started kindergarten yet. He was four years old. Now he's 24. He's graduated from college. He lives in the Bay Area. And he's a software developer at Adobe. So he got me into tech. But I'm jumping ahead. Um, when I moved here, I was fresh out of college. I had an art degree, specifically a degree in photography. But I did draw all the slides in this deck. So I had a quick 15 minutes of fame as a fine artist, but most of my adult career I've spent as a wedding photographer. So I worked for other photographers for a while, and then I owned my own wedding photography business for over a decade. So I did the math once, and my best guess is that I've photographed over 500 weddings. Can you imagine? They're terrible, everyone. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but, but really, in the end, I grew to absolutely hate it. It was repetitive work. I didn't feel like I was growing. I was always overwhelmed with, with work, and I didn't like it at all. So in 2014, when my brother, who's a professional musician, his band Mutual Benefits got some notoriety. They got on like Pitchfork's top 50 albums of the year and Rolling Stone and all that jazz. And he invited me to come be in the band and go on tour. So I jumped at the chance. So in 2014, I spent my savings returning couples their wedding photography deposits. I was like, I am out. And so here's your money. My partner at the time, we'd been together eight years. They weren't supportive, so broke up with them. <laughs> I put all of my stuff into storage, and I lived address-free for a whole year touring as a, a performer and mutual benefit. So when I came back, I didn't know what to do with my life. I knew what I didn't want to do with my life, and that is wedding photography. <laughs> and so, at first I drove for Lyft, as one does when they need money right now. And then I started working as a server. I worked for some years as a server at Uchiko, which you all may know. 
And then um, later I worked as a server at Bolden Creek Cafe, which you also might know. Boulder Creek Cafe, if you know me personally at all, Boulder Creek Cafe is way more me, like way more my speed. But regardless, my son's in college, he's studying software engineering, and he's like, Mom, you would really like this, you would like tech, you should try it out. And so I did, I listened to my son, and in January 2019, I wrote my first line of code. So then I enrolled in a prep course, uh-oh, my slide isn't loading. Oh, that's sad. Imagine me typing away, and there's a clock going in the background. Um, I enrolled in a prep course for the coding boot camp that I wanted to take, and the prep course itself was 120 hours of work. And so I got, that, I got through that, and then I was able to pass the entrance exam. And so after the entrance exam, I needed to do pre-course work, and I did 120 hours of work solo before I was able to start the boot camp. And then I started the boot camp in July, and the boot camp was 11 hour days, six days a week, and it lasts for three months. So from July, like sometime in July to sometime in October, I was in the boot camp. And in October 2019, I uh, graduated, and then I applied for a job at IBM to be a cloud developer. So the first time I ever learned about Kubernetes was in preparation, oh, this is sad, for this, uh, <laughs> or maybe it's extra exciting. <laughs> it could go either way, right? <laughs> so the first time um, I ever heard about Kubernetes ever was in preparation for this job interview at IBM. And somehow, I got hired in November 2019, so less than a year after writing my first line of code, I, got, I was hired as a cloud developer at IBM. So I was making, I went from like being a server to making a six-figure salary. I was like, what is this world? I don't even know. But specifically, I was hired to travel to client sites to build out proof of concepts using IBM products. So I think it maybe wasn't the most desirable job for people who had more experience than me. <laughs> but here's the thing. The hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours I spent learning how to code, that was all learning full stack web development. And I just got a job as a cloud developer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I didn't know what I didn't know, which thank God I didn't because I would have like quit before I started, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I got to IBM, and it started to dawn on me what is going on. I had major, major imposter syndrome. So I thought any second they're going to figure out I don't know what I'm doing. And like they're paying me so much money, more money than I understand. And then they're just going to be like, you, <laughs> like you got to get out of here. <laughs> you don't belong. So, there's, so to give this some context, some, there's so much I didn't understand. So I didn't understand. It took me a while to really understand that. Like a box is the same thing as a node, is the same thing as a machine, which is the same thing as a host, which is the same thing as a server. Like it's all just a computer. Like why can't we just say computer? <laughs> um, I would personally, like as a human being, I, I was so different. Like looking around, all the other people they hired in this position, this pre-sales position, they were all fresh boot camp grads or fresh fresh college grads. So I was 20 years older than a lot of them and at least 10 years older than most of the others. And then I'm a woman. There are not so many of us in this field. There may be 20%, less than 20% in this job position in particular were, was women. So I, I was not, I mean, I kind of blend in. I like to think I'm young at heart and all that, but you know, I felt really different. But despite all this, I was determined to do well at this job. I was going to make this work. So among other things, I did my, my very best to pay attention to even the most boring meetings with everyone's camera off and all of that. And I also, I use a flashcard deck called Anki, like a technology called Anki. And I made flashcards of all the tech concepts, all the jargon, all the acronyms I came across. And I would study those each morning before work. So during this time, I also found my first mentor, Maurice. Um, keep in mind, this is not only my first ever tech job, but it's also my first ever corporate job. So I remember asking Maurice silly stuff like, why does everyone keep saying Q2? 
what's Q2 Q2? <laughs> what's that about? Uh, for the un uninitiated, that's quarter two, and corporate land is divided up into quarters, which still feels kind of arbitrary, honestly. Um, and then Maurice would help me grow as a good mentor does by helping me figure out the next best step career-wise, by introducing me to different people in the org who could help me at the right time, and much later when it was time to start asking for a promotion, he, he was the one who nudged me to do that too. And I made progress. Time moved forward, and despite my constant fears, I didn't get laid off. So then when I'd been there just a few months, I was like checking out Slack. There's an Austin-specific IBM Slack workspace that I was in, and I saw this post that intrigued me. It was a call for SMEs to make lightboard videos for the IBM Cloud light like YouTube channel. Do you know what the first thing I did was when I saw that post? I Googled what SME means. <laughs> it's subject matter experts, and I knew for certain there's no universe where I'm a subject matter expert in anything that IBM Cloud might want to make a video about. And I'm not talking about wedding photography. Uh, I refuse. Um, but the posting didn't give a lot of information, so I just filled out this really casual form saying I'm interested in because I thought maybe these things are scripted, and I just have to come in and perform it, and that might actually be a good way for me to learn the material. So, um, so I, I filled it out and I sent it off. And then um, many months, like, I, like the pandemic happened. So then I kind of forgot it ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> so many months later, once the office reopened to essential personnel, that's when I heard from the IBM Cloud YouTube team. And then they got on a video call with me. And they kept using the word rock star. Like, you're going to be such a rock star. And that's just like, you don't know me. <laughs> I don't think you understand. I'm so new. I know so, so little. And uh, during that call, I did ask them, like, can I just act it out? Like, do I, have to, do I have to write the thing? Like, yes, it's my responsibility to write all of the content, to design the board, to, uh, I, to tell someone else how to do the animations that are part of those. The content was 100% me, but I had a production team backing me up. So the IBM Cloud team reassured me we can make just one video. If it's not good, we can redo it. If it's super terrible, we can just call the whole thing off. <laughs> and there's no harm in trying. So I'm like, OK, OK, there's no harm in trying. Let's do this. So the next thing I did was find another mentor, so this time a technical mentor, because I didn't trust myself to like come up with the best story if I was going to present a tech in 10 minutes. I didn't honestly trust myself to even use all of the jargon correctly. So I put together a video, I figured out everything I want to say, and then I met with my technical mentor, Rick, and went over, this is what I'm thinking for the video, this is what I'm going to do here, here, and here, and to make sure I had someone technical telling me I wasn't making an ass of myself. And then I was ready to record. So this is, these are actual photos from my very first day behind the light board at IBM, and it was so scary. The first takes of the first video, the handwriting was like really shaky on the board because I was like so nervous. I was shaking. And then, okay, nine months after I learned about the mere existence of Kubernetes, IBM Cloud published a video called What is Etcd? On the, and uh, even today, if you Google What is Etcd, this video comes up first. Wild. It has over 55,000 views. I'm a little afraid to watch it. Um, <laughs> at first, at the, when I first made it, I definitely could not watch it. And the, looking at the YouTube comments, I, don't, I think it took me six months before I was brave enough to look at any YouTube comments about anything. I felt like a total imposter. It made me like physically feel sick because not only was I insecure, but then I was now thrust in the public eye a bit as being insecure. But I it's somehow my intuition still told me it was the place I should be, so I, I powered through the discomfort. And I was getting a lot of positive feedback, so from my team, from IBM Cloud folks, from Maurice and Rick, my mentors, and so I kept making them. Over the next year, I made six more IBM Cloud YouTube videos. Altogether, they have more than a million views. So meanwhile, at the actual part of my job, the pre-sales part, that team got dissolved, and then I got 
quote unquote promoted into customer success. I was a customer success manager. But I wanted to stay technical and I feel like I w was pushing to stay technical and I kept being pulled into soft skills stuff. And before long, the videos became my favorite part of working at IBM. And then my friend told me that there's this a position that exists in the world called developer advocate when your whole job is to engage and educate the community. So I started getting curious about developer advocate jobs and I saw one open at VMware and it was a job requirement that called for deep Kubernetes expertise, which I 100% did not have. But has that stopped me <laughs> at any other point in the story? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I applied for the job. I figured worst case scenario, I'll have some conversations with some nice people, I'll get a feel for what's out there. No biggie. And you know what? I did not get that job, nor should I have. But they liked me so much that they made a whole new position just for me. And I got onto the, yeah, the VMware Tanzu Developer Advocacy Team. Thank you. So this is my current job still three years later. They got me this Lightboard setup. So I have a Lightboard Studio in my home right now. So my first order of business was to create uh, some content with this Lightboard. So I made a streaming show called Enlightening, and I still make these episodes even now. Um, so on Enlightening, I invite an expert to come on my show and teach me about whatever it is they're an expert in, usually a specific CNCF project these days. Um, the idea is I know nothing, and you have to explain to me from scratch. So I need to get all the context. I need to understand what problem your tech is solving. I need a nice, good overview of it. And then if you want later, we can dig into your features and your use cases and stuff. But it's a really good place um, to get an overview of what's happening and it's in a time-constrained format. They're not short shows. They're usually a couple hours each. But it's, so I'll draw it out on my, I'll ask a ton of questions, draw all the learnings on the board as I learn. And I can't pretend, I can't fake to know how to know something if I'm writing it out on the board, right? So the, this one was about cartographer. Um, this one is about cloud native build packs. And I've done about 70 of these episodes now. And this one is about SigStore. So another, I also am a CNCF ambassador. CNCF stands for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So as ambassador, I can do some things. And one thing I do is I'm one of the hosts of the, their Cloud Native Live show. So um, CNCF members can come onto this show and teach about an open source technology that's dear to them. And so it's, a, it's just a super hands-on show and we ask a lot of questions and it's super fun. And then my most popular show is definitely You Choose. So this one I co-host alongside my friend Victor Farsik and it's a choose your own adventure style show through the CNCF landscape. So in every episode, we have a system design choice, and we gather all the relevant CNCF tech that can do that choice, and we have a maintainer on from each project. Then the maintainer gets only five minutes to present about their project. We're serious about that five minutes. We have a gong and everything. We're gonna like get a cane and pull them off the stage. Because again, we just want the overview. Like We don't want all the nitty gritty stuff. And then we have a question answer part of the show, and then we put it to a vote. We ask the community to vote, and whichever tech the community chooses is the one we implement into our ongoing demo. We stress they're not a winner, it's just what people are curious to learn more about. Um, so what helped me to get so far so quickly in my very short career? I've been doing this for about four years now, like knowing what Kubernetes is. If you even count me knowing what Kubernetes is when I started working. Um, so. For one thing, I'm always 100% me. I never pretend to know something I don't know. I'm so willing to say I don't know. I'm so willing to ask clarifying questions. I'm not afraid of seeming new because I am totally new. S Another thing is when you're scared, when I'm scared, I think that means I'm about to grow. I frame it in that way. So I, I think the price of accelerated progress is just being uncomfortable all the time. I'm uncomfortable now, <laughs> you know, like I'm just always uncomfortable. <laughs> um, be open, don't be judgmental. Don't be judgmental toward yourself, 
But don't be judgmental toward even a tech. Like every open source technology has maintainers behind it who are pouring their heart and soul into that technology. I think we're also, we want to have a take and a judgment and something that's ours. I think there's a lot of value to just staying open and curious. And even if a tech's not for you, you can still take the time to understand who it is for. Like what's a good use case for that tech? Be kind to yourself, to your to other people. My... Mm, but I grew up in a household that was kind, but also we viewed people, I was taught to view people who are similar to me as competition. And at some point during my adulthood, I've learned to see people who do the same thing I do as my community. And that, to me, is the success, like the secret to being happy in life. Like people around you lift each other up, make each other happy, get excited about each other's excess successes. It makes all the difference. Loosen your identity. It makes me cringe when people say, I can't draw, or I'm not technical. Like, you are a manifestation of where you put your time and your energy. I actually, I may have a degree in art, but I didn't start drawing until I started presenting and making slides, and I, I never really drew before that. So you can, you can do what you set yourself out, set out to do. And then in the theme of the, the conference, embrace change. So I kind of glossed over this part, but it was a really big deal when I decided to dissolve my wedding photography of business after 10 years. Like, it was everything I knew. I built up so many connections. I built up so much, so much photography knowledge, so much business knowledge. But if I didn't completely let that go, there wouldn't have been room for me to become who I am today. So I can say, thank you, wedding photography, you served me. I'm sorry I'm so mean to you. <laughs> you served me well. I've learned a lot, but it's time for me to do something else now. And I couldn't even know what that something else was. Like, I had those peri pe that period of, like, being a server and a Lyft driver while I was figuring it out. So I jumped into the abyss, and I think, and I have no regrets about it whatsoever. Very practically, Anki. That really made a big difference on how I learned fast. I don't want to be remiss if I didn't miss, mention it. And then mentors and collaborators are a huge, huge thing. Mentors I already talked about. Collaborators, incredible too. I've collaborated with wildly knowledgeable and experienced humans, with conference talks, with uh, streaming shows, having them as guests on my show. And it's such a gift every time someone like that is willing to share their time and their expertise with me. And um, I wouldn't be where I am now without all the wonderful, wonderful humans I've encountered along the way. So that's the end of the autobiographical part of the talk. If you see me around, please say hi. I'm very kind. I have lots of stickers to give away. And now, as a woman in tech, I feel I have to give at least some part of a technical talk because I have some stereotypes to dismantle. So <laughs> thank you. Look, oh my god, is that an application running in production? Oh. That's Hero. Oh, wow, amazing. I remember back when Hero was just source code on a developer's laptop. Back then, Hero had these big dreams to be a real application running a production serving and users, and look, now they've done it. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so happy for them. To get to production, they've had to overcome so much. They've had to navigate so many system design choices and tools. <laughs> <laughs> like, for example, to become a container image, you had to think about all these tools, pick one, and then now they're, they, they've evolved. They're a new form now. They did the same with the container image registry. They had to pick a good technology and evolve and move on. And so, Hero's done this. They've made a production cluster with Kubernetes resources. They've written their own application configuration. Hopefully, they'll get a tool to help them do that so it's not quite so overwhelming. They've also implemented GitOps, and now they're deployed in the cluster. Look at them. They're a new form now. They're running application, and the end users are able to access them through Ingress. Dang, Hero, living their dream. I'm so excited. Oh, but wait, Hero. Did you implement any security features in your production cluster? <laughs> oh, no, you didn't? There's no security? Oh, everybody, the hero, the data, the system, the users, everyone's in danger. No, we got to do something. All right.
right, so not to fear. Today here is going to make four more system design choices that are going to increase cluster security. So here is going to add cluster level policies. Here is going to add one for runtime security. We need to choose a technology that will help us manage our secrets. And finally, we need to secure pod-to-pod -pod communication. Now, this is in no way exhaustive. These are not all the possible security things you should do to your cluster. There are just four of them. And when I show you some tools for each one, again, not exhaustive, not all the tools, just some of the tools to get an idea for what we're looking for in these particular projects. But our goal is to get Hero running in a secure, more secure production environment. So let's talk about admission controller policies, or I like to call these cluster level policies. Some tools that can do this, Kyverno, OPA Gatekeeper, and Cubewarden. So why does Hero need cluster level policy at all? Well, as things stand, uh, apps that are running in our cluster can become huge and bloated. They can use way more resources than what they need. They can run outdated versions of stuff. They can also um, use untrusted images. So we need to make some organization policy that can stop this from happening. So a policy, a cluster level policy, is an organization specific rule about actions that are or are not allowed to happen to certain objects in the system. So some examples would be you can say if your compute, if you don't have compute limits set, then you're not allowed to run in the cluster. Or you have to have these certain versions or you're not allowed to run in the cluster. I'm talking about admission now. But um, or you can't um, you, the, the images you use must be signed and trusted, scanned, verified, that sort of thing. So how do cluster-level cluster policies work? Well, when you create one of these policies, you add configuration to the Cube API in the form of an admission controller webhook. So basically, you're teaching Cube API, if a request comes into the cluster that falls under the jurisdiction of this rule, before doing anything else, send that request to the admission controller. What's the admission controller? The admission controller is a piece of software. That's the admission controller. It's a piece of software, and it can either be a validating admission controller or a mutating admission controller. So a validating admission controller gets that request and says, yes, this is allowed, or no, this is not allowed. A mutating emission controller gets that request, and if it wants to, it might, it might not, it could ch can change that resource altogether and then send the mutated object back to the Cube API. But regardless, there's a response, and then the Cube API moves forward acting in organizational policy. So let's talk about our tools. Kyverno is a Kubernetes native admission controller. So it is purpose built for Kubernetes. With Kyverno, you make your policy in YAML, kind of. You make it in, uh, <laughs> I, the, the people who use Kyverno are laughing right now. Um, <laughs> so you use, it's called Kyverno JSON query language is what you're actually writing in your policy in, but it, it's meant to look and feel like YAML, with the idea of people writing policy are probably very familiar with YAML. Um, it has a lot of other bells and whistles too, but those aren't the differentiators, so we're gonna move on to the next one, which is OPA Gatekeeper. OPA stands for Open Policy Agent, and OPA without the gatekeeper part is a platform agnostic policy, policy engine tool. So you could write policy for all kinds of things in your whole system, not just for Kubernetes specific things. But then the gatekeeper part pulls OPA into Kubernetes so you can now use it with Kubernetes uh, stuff too. So, with OPA Gatekeeper, you have to write your policy in Rego, which is notoriously difficult to use. So if you're not already using Rego, if you don't already have Rego experts then in your uh, organization, then maybe it's not the best choice. But if you do, it's a great choice. And then we have Cubewarden. Cubewarden's like, hey, what if I don't want to write my policy in YAML and I don't want to write it in Rego? <laughs> That's not so far-fetched. And so with Cubewarden, you write your policy in whatever language you want. It gets compiled into a WASM module. That WASM module is also an OCI artifact, and then it runs as part of the Cubewarden admission controller. This is a newer project, so it has fewer bells and whistles, but it still has um, some good ones. So those are that. And now our hero has, the hero chose Kyverno arbitrarily. And then now we have admission policy in our cluster and hero's slightly safer. 
So next, let's talk about runtime security. Tools that can do this are Falco and CubeArmor. But why do we need runtime security? Well, do you know, do you trust every internal application that's running? Do you trust all of your third-party tools? Do you trust all the dependencies of your applications and third-party tools? Do you trust every single process that's running in your cluster? There are probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. How do you know if like one process and all those processes is misbehaving? That's where runtime security comes in. So with runtime security, you monitor your system at the kernel level. And so you're meant to detect risks and threats that are happening during execution, like application execution. And so you're securing against unknown unknowns at runtime. This is the Linux kernel we're opening up to. <laughs> um, so we do the monitoring at the kernel level of each host machine. So the security is not application specific. We get those, collect those monitoring metrics, and then we can use those kernel level events to define the, the behavior that we expect to happen in our system. And then we can create policy that does something if something unexpected happens. And so we, um, what that something is depends on the tool, so I'm gonna dig into those. So Falco is a cloud native threat detector. Falco gets sources from the kernel level, as I just discussed, there's a kernel level um, of probe, an eBPF probe, and the Falco kernel module. Those are the two things. It also can get sources from plugins. There are 13 different plugins, but plugin sources might be Kubernetes logs or cloud provider logs or Gvisor or something. And so in, in Falco, you make a rule, which is a set of conditions that when they're met, they trigger an alert. And then that alert is simply a text message with some sort of priority attached to it. So then there are sub-projects that can do something. So Falco Sidekick can take those alerts and forward them to like 50 or 60 different compatible destinations. And Falco Talon can take that alert and then do something like kill a container or start collecting information or something. And that's Falco. Next up is CubeArmor. CubeArmor also does monitoring. It also does alerting, but it also does prevention. So with Cube Armor, when an attack is attempted, it fails. And Cube Armor is able to do this using LSMs or Linux security modules, which are access control to the Linux kernel. And so it hooks into the Linux kernel using eBPF, so it only does those kernel events, but it's able to do that in a safe and performant way. And then it also can supply recommended policy based on industry standard. And that is Cube Armor. And Hero decided to implement CubeArmor, and we have runtime policy in our cluster. Woohoo! So now we need to manage secrets. There's, we have external secrets operator, secret store CSI driver, and SOPs. And there's so much confidential information that our application has to worry about. And so usually a vault technology is used to manage this. So a vault technology is a piece of software that stores secrets safely and has an API to access it, to interact with it, and that's the bare minimum for a vault. But it probably also does remediation when secrets leak, it probably helps with secrets rotation. But the vault part is not what we're gonna talk about. What we need to worry about now, our problem for Hero, is how are we gonna get the secrets into the cluster? That's what our technologies do. So they all do it differently, so I'm going to jump right into the technologies. External secrets operator is an operator in your Kubernetes cluster. It connects to the Vault API, it retrieves the secret, it makes a Kubernetes secret, it manages the lifecycle of that Kubernetes secret. Now Hero can get to it, and ba ba da da Hero has the secret. Woo! All right. That secrets, um, external secrets operator, it also has two cool alpha features. It does push secrets, so it can take all or part of a Kubernetes secret and push it to a vault. It also can generate secrets. Next, we have secret store CSI driver. Secret store CSI driver, that's a Kubernetes SIG auth subproject, and they're like, you know what? Kubernetes secrets aren't that secret. They're just base64 encoded and stored in etcd. I think we should make a secret solution that doesn't use Kubernetes secrets, the Kubernetes secrets abstraction at all. So they've decided to do this using CSI or container storage interface, which is a, uh, a standardization for how the Kubelet interfaces with external storage vendors. And so when you, make it, when you wanna make a secret, first it writes a temporary file system volume 
to the pod. It attaches that volume to the pod. Then it retrieves the secret and writes that secret to the volume. And now our application can access the secret as though it's part of a, part of the file system. Da 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 da. Okay. And the problem is with this is that all your third-party tools are are going to expect to receive secrets as Kubernetes secrets. So you still need to store and manage Kubernetes secrets as part of uh, managing Kubernetes. So we didn't, you, you don't get around them all together. And another thing is you can encrypt your secrets, at, you can and should encrypt your secrets at rest. So when you, they say it's just Base64 and, and encoded and stored in etcd, you can encrypt them more deeply than that, and you should. Um, then we have SOPS. SOPS is short for Secrets Operations, but if you call it Secrets Operations, no one will know what you're talking about. So it's SOPS. SOPS is just, all it is is a CLI that encrypts and decrypts files. So in our particular cluster with Hero, in all, our particular use case, we'd have a Kubernetes manifest that defines the secret that we want to create, the Kubernetes secret we want to create for Hero. And then we'd use the SOPS CLI to encrypt the, the confidential part of that. And now we have a file that we can check into Git, that we can email, that we can print out and frame and hang on the wall. You can do anything with it. It's safe. And only whoever has this decryption key is able to read it. So how does that work in our workflow? So we take our encrypted file, check it into Git. Argo CD picks up the change, and then Argo CD recognizes, oh, this is an encrypted file. And so we have to teach Argo CD what to do with a configuration management plugin. But once we do that, Argo CD is like, OK, I know how to use the CLI to get the decryption key, our vault has the decryption key now, not the secret. And then it's, well, I'm going to decrypt it and then apply, and now we have a Kubernetes secret, and ba 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 That seems complicated. Why do I want to do that? <laughs> well, the SOS folks, basically, this isn't really the use case it's designed for, but it, uh, it's just necessary for my storytelling. What it's meant for is like smaller organizations when having a full-fledged vault technology is overkill. And so here's a, a lightweight, more simple solution for that, or just for sharing secrets within an organization. So those are our secrets management technologies, and we've added secrets management to Heroes production cluster. And the last one, the securing pod to pod communications. For this, we have Istio, Linkerd, and Cilium. So there are three aspects of securing communications between pods. The first one is identity. Each pod needs its own identity, and they need to verify, be able to verify each other's identity. The second one is encryption. All the transmissions between pods need to be encrypted. And then the third one is policy. So poli two pods that shouldn't need to talk, like that have no business talking to each other, shouldn't in be even able to talk to each other. So Istio and Linkerd both accomplish these goals using a sidecar model. So to illustrate this, I have a simple cluster that's flattened now. So what these technologies do is they add what's called a sidecar or a proxy, but they add an extra container in to every single pod that's running in this cluster. And this container is, um, intercepts all the call calls to and from the workload container. So in general, it adds networking security and observability, but uh, we're just talking about these three aspects. So um, I like to say, so the Istio in Linkerd is referred to as the control plane. As a super noob, this confused me because I only knew the Kubernetes control plane was the control plane, but people also say this is the control plane. So, And then um, all of the proxies together, that can be called the data plane. People also call that the networking layer. But how does that help with our three goals? So the first two goals, identity encryption and encryption, those are solved with mutual TLS or MTLS using uh, X509 certificates or PKI infrastructure or digital certificates. I'm trying to make it less complicated, but I'm making it sound more complicated. But there are just so many words to describe the same concepts, it's confusing. Um, but basically, it's, a, it's accomplishing these two things. And then thirdly, each of the technologies, Istio and Linkerd, supply custom resources where you're able to define policy for what pods should be able to talk to each other. So what differentiates Istio and then Linkerd? Istio is the most full-fledged, fully featured service mesh technology out there, period. If you can do it with service mesh, you can almost certainly do it with Istio. 
For the data plane, for the networking layer, Istio uses a technology called Envoy, which is very powerful and very complex. Then we have Linkerd. Linkerd can do most of the things. It can do almost all of the things. It has advanced functionality, but really it is focused on being easy to use and it's focused on being performant. So for that networking layer, instead of using Envoy, it uses, um, it uses a custom written Rust proxy. And that custom Linkerd folks will see like that proxy takes only 10% of the resources of what Envoy does that Istio uses. But then I asked the Envoy people about it, and they were like, ah, that used to be true a few years ago maybe, but now they're about the same. Um, the truth is probably in the middle somewhere. So that's that. Those are those two. And then we have Cilium. Cilium is a whole different beast. Cilium is a CNI implementation. CNI stands for Container Networking Interface. And it is a specification for how a kubelet assigns an IP address to a pod. So a conversation between kubelet and Cilium might go something like this. Hey, Cilium, can I have an IP address for a pod, please? Yeah, here's your networking stack, including that IP address. Thank you, love you. <laughs> also, I'm going to use a technology called Spiffy to give an identity to that pod you're creating. That's great, you do you. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm gonna attach an eBPF program to the pod network namespace at the kernel level. This has nothing to do with me. <laughs> and now I can safely inspect and manipulate every pod event from this pod and from every pod in the whole cluster that I helped you create. Uh, I think I hear Cube API calling me. I gotta go. <laughs> so Cilium can do a lot of stuff with this eBPF program, but how does it relate to our three aspects of securing pod-to-pod -pod communication? Well, we talked about identity. It adds identity with Spiffy, and Spiffy's also gonna take care of verifying other pods' identity to one another. And it does encryption too. Now the encryption's decoupled from the identity and you can choose your encryption technology. So right now you can choose either Wireshark or IPsec for the encryption. And then also you can do network policy. Yes, it's with Cilium resources. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so Cilium, um, the one uh, last thing I wanna say about Cilium is it literally, like your, your cluster cannot function without a CNI implementation. So if you already have a running cluster, it's hard to add a different CNI when you've already built everything on top of one CNI. So that's just worth mentioning when you're considering Cilium. And those are our technologies. And here is Hero. This is the mess of the cluster we made. Now it has lots of security features added, admission controller policy, runtime security. Uh, we have the secrets management and securing pod-to-pod -pod communications. And now Hero is doing so awesome. I'm so happy for them. Yeah, thanks. That's me. That's the end. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. <laughs> Get it. Thanks.